Ready, hit the star button. Hit the like button. Or the heart. Or subscribe. There's no stars. There's no stars on Everybody, Facebook. Everybody, let's go hit the like button. Or the heart. Yeah. But today. Today we're going to be reading another story. We're going to be reading from Mark since we did Daniel. I'm going to tell them what we're going to do. That's okay. Nobody's watching. See, there's no, there's no numbers there. But today we're going to be reading the Dragon King of New Life. Yeah, we don't know what the stuff is. Yeah. But today we are going to be having a lot of fun. Fun. Um. Yeah, I'll hand it off to my dad. Hi. How's everybody doing? So, I know that yesterday I told everybody that we were going to read chapters 13 and 14 of the book of Daniel. So I couldn't find my Catholic Bible. And so that was my first stop. So I checked out my French Bible and my Bible in French actually doesn't have da Daniel chapters 13 and 14. It does have all of the books of the Bible in a complete, or the Old Testament anyway, in a completely different order than what I'm used to. Um, Daniel was after the Psalms, but some of the, the prophets were before the Psalms. And it was just all kerfuffle. And like, R I think Ruth was after Psalms. And so, I mean, it was it was weird, the order. And I guess I hadn't noticed that before because I hadn't ever read anything contiguously. Usually I just read like a verse or two at a time when I'm reading my, my French Bible um, because I don't speak French that well. Um, so I know that I was, said that I was going to read Daniel chapters 13 and 14. I did find it on my phone, but um, I read through it and I don't know. I, it is what it is. So we're going to read one of my four favorite gospels today. Anybody want to guess which one it is? Oh, there's nobody on. Well, JJ's already given it away. So Yes, we're going to read the book of Mark. So Mark has, is it 14 or 16 chapters? I think it's 16. 16 chapters. Yep, 16. And we will, should be finishing in a couple of weeks. So just like Daniel talked about 70 weeks, but this is going to be two weeks. All right, so here is, I'm, I'm really waiting for somebody to be on. Okay. Usually Kimmy's on by now, so. Yeah, they might. That's true, they could be swimming. Okay, so I'm going to just go ahead and start reading. This is the Gospel according to Mark. Um, Mark is traditionally, according to Eusebius, or Eusebius, um, Mark, what? No, Eusebius, not Josephus. According to Eusebius, uh, Mark was the gospel according to Peter, um, because Mark went around with Peter, Luke went around with Paul. So um, Luke is actually, okay, Kimmy's in the shower. Um, Luke is actually Paul, whatever I just said, Luke is actually Paul's gospel and Mark is Peter's gospel. So, or did I get those backwards? I'm pretty sure I said it right. Okay. She's just getting out of the shower. Okay, perfect. So here is the gospel according to Mark. This is the English standard version of the Bible. Um, if you want to know why I'm not reading Daniel, then you can uh, go back after you're done listening and figure that out if you didn't hear it already. Here we are. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. 
the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as of the scribes or as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you done to us, or done with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him, and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came back, or sorry, he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up and the fever left her, and she began to serve him, serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone who is looking, or everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went through all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, 
show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in, a, in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. And that's the end of chapter one. I hope you're enjoying the book of Mark. Again, I'm 99% sure that this is Peter's gospel um, that Mark collected from his sermons and, and um, just traveling around with him and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so we are going to um, continue with the um, story Dragon Singer as soon as mom is able to get settled down. I appreciate we've got four people on. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, let me know who you are in the comments. And today is hit the like button day. So if you haven't done so already, go ahead and hit that like button right now. Or you could hit the heart or the happy face or the, the what is it, the, the laughy face or the whatever it is. No, that's, that's YouTube, the subscribe button. So um, just go ahead and hit one of those, and that'll be great. And thank you for joining us, and we will see you again, or I'll see you again tomorrow. But here comes Mom with Dragon Singer. Yeah, I'm going to move it back without knocking over the water. There we go. Hi. What? I'm trying to figure out what page we're on. No, our bed's not ready. Okay. Love you. Sorry that I did not, we didn't have live stream last night. I ate something that I shouldn't have, I guess, and was very sick for the rest of the night. But I feel totally fine now. Except for being like really hot. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm running around I'm trying I'm to get everything done. I'm your no, you go lay down. Go lay down, puppy. Go lay down, puppy. Okay, go. I'm going to count whatever number I get to is how many days without we or switch. Okay. Uh, we're chapter seven, I believe. Sure. Sure. I chapter no idea. That's what I said. Sorry, that is what I said. I put you put chapter no idea. Uh, okay. All right. Chapter seven. Don't leave me alone. I cry in the night of anguish heart stricken of soul killing fright. The restlessness of the fire lizards about her woke mentally from a deep sleep. She wished irritably that they didn't insist on sleeping with her. It had been an exciting and trying day and she'd had a hard enough time getting to sleep. Her hand ached so from the day's playing that she'd had to slather the scar with numbweed to dull the pain. Beauty's tail twitched violently against Mentally's ear. Okay, get dogs. I can't, you can't sit on my feet. Go, go every night. Thank you. <laughs> She nudged the little queen, hoping to stir her out of whatever dream disturbed her. But Beauty was awake, not dreaming, her eyes yellow and whirling with anxiety. All the fire lizards were awake and unusually alert in the dark of the night. Seeing that Menelie's eyes were open, Beauty crooned a half-fearful, half-worried sound. Rocky and Diver minced up Menelie's legs and crouched on her stomach, extending their heads toward her. Their eyes, too, were whirling with the speed and shade of fear. The rest, cuddling close against her, crooned for comfort. Propping herself up on one elbow, Menely peered toward, sorry, there's a fly, peered toward the open windows. She just, she could just distinguish the Fort Hold fire heights, black against dark sky. It took her some time to locate the dark bulk of the watch dragon. He was motionless, so whatever distur distressed the fire lizards did not apparently concern him. Whatever is your problem, beauty? The little queen's croon increased in intensity. First Rocky, then Diver added their notes. Aunties one and two crept up and nuzzled to get under Menelie's left arm. Lazy mimic and uncle burrowed into the fur at her right side. 
their twined tails latching fiercely onto her wrist while Brownie piteously paced against her across her feet. They were afraid. Hi, Kimmy. Chapter seven is Granny Bear's favorite. What's gotten into you? Mentally couldn't for the life of her imagine anything within the Harpercraft Hall that would menace them. Covet them? Yes. Injure them? No. Shush a minute and let me listen. Beauty and Rocky gave little spurting sounds of fear, but they obeyed her. She listened as hard as she could, but the only sounds of the night air were the comfortable murmur of men's voices and an occasional laugh from the hall beneath her. It wasn't as late as it had first seemed to her then, if the masters and old journeymen were still chattering. Gently disengaging tails, mentally slipped from her fur, sleeping furs to the window. Several rectangles of light shone on the stones of the courtyard, two from the great hall, go, and one above it, from Robinson's quarters beyond hers. Beauty gave a worried cheep and flew to Mentally's shoulder, wrapping her tail lightly around the girl's neck and burrowing into her, her hair from the furs. So Mentally hurried, returned, oh, sorry, burrowed into her hair, the slender little body trembling. The others set up an anxious clamor from the furs, so Mentally hurriedly returned to them. They were panic stricken. The Master Harper might not approve of Sylvina's moving her into this room if her fire lizards disturbed his studies at night. She tried to quiet them with a soft song, but now Beauty's voice was curiously above her lullaby. Mentally gathered all of the fire lizards against her. Their tails twined about her arms so firmly that she couldn't use her hands to stroke them. Now she felt a confused sense of imminent danger. Clearly, all the fire lizards were responding to a mutually experienced threat. Mentally fought against the panic their fear stirred in her. You're being ridiculous. Um, what can harm us in the Harper Hall? with their heads cheeping in mounting distress. Through their touch of mind, she got the distinct impression that they were reacting to a fear beyond them, beyond the walls at a distance. Then how could it hurt you? Suddenly their terror erupted in her with such intensity that she cried out, don't. Her injunction was spontaneous. She tried to throw up her arms to protect herself from this unknown danger, but her hands were lizard bound. Their fear was completely and utterly hers, and incoherently she repeated the cry, don't, don't. In her mind, out of nowhere, mentally received an un or indelible impression of turbulence, savage, ruthless, destructive, a pressure inexorable and deadly, churning masses of slick, sickly gray surfaces that heaved and dipped, heat as massive as a tidal wave, fear, terror, and an inarticulate longing. A scream heard in her mind, a scream like a knife upon raw nerves. Don't leave me alone. Mentally didn't think she had cried out. She was as far as she could think sanely, certainly that she hadn't heard that heard the cry, but she knew that the words had been spoken at the extreme of someone's anguish. Simultaneously, the door to her room burst open and the watch dragon of the hold fire heights let out a shriek, so like the one in her mind that the wonder that she wondered if the dragon had called before. But dragons don't speak. Mentally, what's wrong? Master Robinson was striding across the floor to her. The fire lizards took wing, darting out one window and back in the next, maniacal with fear. The dragon, mentally pointed, diverting Robinson's eyes to the window to prove that she wasn't alone in alarm. They both saw the watch dragon launching himself riderless into the sky, bugling his distress. Robinson and mentally heard on the night air the faint echo of answering bugles, a moment of silence, and then the eerie screech of an hysterical watchtower Watchwear from the Fort Hold Court. Is every winged thing in the hold out of his mind? Asked Robinson. What made you scream, Mentally? Don't what? I don't know, Mentally cried, tears streaming down her face. She experienced a profound grief now and hugged herself against the chill of an awe-filled panic she couldn't explain and yet had experienced so profoundly. I just don't know. Robinson ducked as Beauty, leading the others, swooped past him and out the window. The queen was screaming at the others to follow. Mentally saw them outlined briefly by the light of the Master Harper's window, and then the entire fair disappeared. Before Mentally, frightened for fear the fire lizards had gone completely from her, could tell Master Robinson, Dominic, or Dominic came charging into the room. Robinson, what's going on? Quiet, Dominic, the Master Harper's stern voice interrupted. Whatever has frightened Mentally has also alarmed the watch dragon, and even the dead could hear that watchtower watchwares howling. 
Furthermore, the dragon went between without his rider. What? Domic was startled, no longer angry. Mentally, said Robinton, his hands warm and firm on her shoulders, his voice kindly calm. Take a deep breath. Now, take another. I can't. I can't. Something terrible is happening, and said Mentally, as she was appalled at the sobs that tore from at her, the cold terror that made her tremble so violently in the grip of this unknown disaster. It's something terrible. Others were crowding at, into her room now, roused by her involuntary cries. Someone said loudly that there wasn't anything stirring in the court or in, on any of the roads. Another remarked that it was ridiculous to be, so, to be startled out of a sleep, a sound sleep by a hysterical child trying to attract attention. Hold your silly tongue, Morshal, said Savannah, pushing through the crowd to Menelie's bed. Better still, get off, of, get off to your beds, all of you. You're no help here. Yes, if you please leave, said Robinson in a voice as close to anger as anyone had ever heard in him. It isn't the eggs hatching, is it? Siebel asked anxiously. Mentally shook her head, struggling to control herself and to stop the spasmodic shudders of fear that were depriving her of voice and wit enough to explain what was so inexplicable. Sylvina was soothing her. Her hands are ice cold, Robinson, she said, and mentally clung to the woman. As Robinson slipped to the other side of the double cot to support her shuddering body, and these aren't hysterical tremors. Abruptly, the spasms eased, then ceased completely. Mentally went limp against Sylvina, gasping for breath, forcing herself to breathe as deeply as Robinson again urged her to do. Whatever was wrong has stopped, she said spent. Sylvina and the harper eased her against the bed rushes, Sylvina drawing the fur up to her neck. Did the fire lizards take a fit? The head woman asked, glancing about the now bright room. They're not here. We saw them go between, I don't know where. They were so afraid, it was incredible. There was nothing I could do. Take your time and tell us, said the master harper. I don't know all of it. I woke because they were so restless. They usually sleep quietly and they got more and more frightened and there wasn't anything, nothing. I could see that. Yes, yes, but something caused them to react, Robinson had captured her hand and was stroking it reassuringly. Tell us the sequence. They were frightened out of their wits and it got to me too. Then and mentally swallowed quickly against the flash of vivid impression. Then in my mind, I was aware of something so dangerous, so terrible, something heaving and gray and deadly, masses of it, all gray and, and terrible, hot too. Yes, the heat was part of the terror, then a longing. I don't know which was the worst. She clustered the comfort, comforting hands and could not keep back the sobs of fright that rose from her guts. I wasn't asleep either. It wasn't just a bad dream. Don't talk anymore, mentally. We can hope the terror has passed completely. No, I have to tell you, that's part of it. I'm supposed to tell. Then I heard only, I didn't hear, except that it was as clear as if someone had shouted it right in this room, right beside my head. I heard something scream, don't leave me alone. The muscles in her body relaxed all at once now that she had spoken of the weight of terror. Don't leave me alone? The harper repeated the words half to himself, puzzling over the significance of the phrase. It's all gone now being afraid, I mean, and the fire lizards swooped back into the room, aiming for the bed, but some of them dipped and darted for the window ledges away from Master Robinson and Sylvina, twittering, but only with surprise, not fear. Beauty and the two bronzes landed on the foot of the double cot, chirping as mentally with little calls, chirping at mentally, ouch, with little calls that sounded so normally inquisitive that mentally let out an exasperated exclamation. Don't scold them mentally, said the Master Harper. See if they can determine, or see if you can determine where they've just been. Um, sorry. Mentally beckoned to Beauty, who obediently crawled up to her arm and permitted Mentally to stroke her head and body. She's certainly not bothered by anything now. Yes, but where did they, she go? Mentally raised Beauty to her face, looking into the idly whirling eyes, laying the back of her hand against Beauty's cheek. Where'd you go, pet? Where have you just been? Beauty stroked Mentally's hand, gave a smug chirrup, cocking her dainty head to one side, but an impression reached Mentally's mind of a weir bowl and many dragons and ex excited people. I think they've been back to Benden Weir. It must be Benden. They don't know Fort Weir well enough to be that vivid. And whatever happened involved many dragons and lots of excited people. Ask Beauty what frightened her. Mentally stroked the little queen's head for a moment longer to reassure her because the question was sure to upset the little fire lizard. It did. Beauty launched herself from Mentally's arms so violently 
that her talons scratched deep enough to draw blood. A dragon falling in the sky? Menelay gasped out the pic gasped out the picture. Dragons don't fall in the sky. She scratched you, child. Oh, that's nothing, Master Robinson, but I don't think we'll get anything more out of her. Beauty was clinging to the fireplace, chittering irritably. Her eyes were wheeling angrily orange. If something had ha has happened at Bended Weir, Master Robinson, remarked Sylvina in a dry tone of voice, they won't be over long in sending for you. Sylvina had to raise her voice to counteract the excited cries of the other fire lizards who were reacting to Beauty's scolding. We'd best not upset the creatures any further now, and I'm getting you a dose, young lady, or you'll never sleep tonight from the look of your, in your eyes. I didn't mean to, to disturb everyone. Sylvina gave her an exasperated snort, dismissing the need for an apology, although Menely couldn't help but see as Sylvina opened the door that Harpers were lingering in the corridor. Menely heard Sylvina berating them and telling them to get off to their beds. What did they think they were about? They knew about fire lizards. The strangest aspect to this incident, Menely, said the Master Harper, his forehead creased with thought lines, is that the dragon reacted too. I've never seen a dragon, short of a mating flight, go off without his rider. I shouldn't wonder, and Robinson smiled wryly, if we don't have Toledon over here demanding an explanation from you for the disappearance of his dragon. The notion of a dragon rider compelled to ask her for advice was so absurd that Menely managed a weak smile. How's that hand? You've been playing a lot, I hear. And the harper turned her left hand over in his. That scar's too red. You have been doing too much. Make haste a little more slowly. Is it painful? Make haste a little more slowly. Not much. Master Old Ive gave me some salve. And your feet? So long as I don't have to stand too much or walk too far. Too bad your fire lizards can't combine to give you one little dragon power. Sir? Yes? I think I have to tell you... My fire lizards can lift things. They brought me my pipes the other day to spare me the walk, she added hastily. They took it from my room at the cot, all in a cluster, and then dropped it into my hands. Now that is very interesting. I didn't realize they had so much initiative. You know, Breck, Miram, and Fenor have got, their th got theirs to carry messages on a collar about their necks. The Master Harper smiled with amusement. Although, they aren't always good about arriving promptly. I think you have to make certain they know how urgent the matter is, like having your pipes for Master Jarrett. I didn't wish to be late, and I can't walk fast. Well, we'll let that stand as the reason then, Menely, said Robinson gently, and when Menely glanced up at him, startled, she saw the kind understanding in his eyes and flushed. He stroked her hand again. What I don't know, I sometimes guess, knowing the way people inter interact, Menely, don't keep too much or so much bottled inside, girl, and do tell me anything unusual that your fire lizards do. That's far more important than why they did it. We don't know much about these tiny cousins of the dragons, and I have a suspicion they'll be very important creatures to us. Is the little white dragon all right? Reading my mind too, mentally? Little Ruth is all right, but the harper's heavy, slightly hesitant tone gave the lie to his reassurance. Don't fret yourself about Jackson and Ruth. Just about everyone else on Pern does. He placed her hand back on the furs with a, a final pat. Sylvina returned, offering Menely the mug she'd brought and stood over her while she downed the dose, gagging a little at the bitterness. Yes, I know, I made it strong on purpose. You need to sleep. And Master Robinson, there's a message from the hold for you below. Urgent, he said, and he's out of breath. Sleep yourself out, Menely, the harper said as he rapidly left the room. Trouble, Menely asked Sylvina, hoping to be told something. Not for you or because of you, my girl, Sylvina chuckled, pushing the sleeping fur under Menely's chin. I understand that Grogue, Lord of Fort Hold, experienced the same unnerving nightmare, as he calls it, that you did and has sent for Master Robinson to explain it to him. Now rest and don't fuss yourself. How could I? You must have doubled that dose of fellas juice, said Menely, relaxing the, and tactless of the grip of the drug. She couldn't keep her eyes open and effortlessly drifted to sleep to the sound of another chuckle from Sylvina. One last thought let her slip easily into unconsciousness. Lord Groves' fire lizards had reacted, so she wasn't hysterical. Now, <laughs> I need a new chair.
I keep banging my feet on this one. Okay. Uh, she awoke slightly at one point, not quite conscious of her surroundings, but aware of a rumbling voice, a treble response and hungry creelings. When she woke completely later, there was an empty bowl on the floor and her friends were curled up about her in slumbering balls with wing lip, wing limp. The gnawing in her stomach suggested that she had slept well into the day and the hunger was all her own. If the fire lizards had been that starved, they'd been awake. Doubtless, Kemo and Pimer had done her the favor of feeding her friends. She grinned. Pimer and Kemo must have been delighted at the chance. The shutters were, wide, were open and with no sounds of music or voices, she guessed it must be afternoon and the, and the hall's population dispersed to their various chores. The watch dragon was back on the fire heights. She sat upright in bed as the memory of the previous night's terror shattered her pleasant somnolence. 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 Yeah. At the same moment, there was a tap on her door and before she could answer, Sylvina entered carrying a small tray. My timing's very good, she said, pleased and smiling. Do you feel rested? Mentally nodded and reply, in reply and thanked Sylvina for the hot cloth she was handed. But if I can be bold, you don't look as if you slept at all. Sylvina's eyes were dark circled and red shot. Well, you're right and you're not bold, but I'm on my way to my bed. I can assure you as soon as I've straightened up for, for Robinton now and said Sylvina, nudged Menelie's hips so the girl made room for her to sit on the bed. You ought to hear what disturbed your friends last night. No one else will think to tell you with the Harper away. Also, I've just checked the eggs and I think you should take a look at them. Not, however, until you've finished your clock. And S Sylvina had a restraining hand on Menelie's shoulder. I want your wits in place and not fellas butted. What happened? The bare bones of the matter are that Fenor, Brown Kant's writer, took it in his head to go to the Red Star last night. Menelie's gasp woke the fire lizards. Mind your thoughts, girl. I don't want them turning hysterical again, thank you. Sylvina waited until the creatures had settled back into their naps. That's what seems to have set the fire lizards off at any rate, and not just yours. Robinson said that anyone who has a fire lizard had the same trouble you did, only with you having nine, it was intensified. What happened was that Kant and Fenor went between to the Red Star. Yes, small wonder you were terrified. What you told us about grayness and all that hideous heat and churning, that's what's on the Red Star. No one could land there. She paused, gave, gave a smug grunt. That'll shut up the Lord Holders for wanting to go there. Kant and Fenor mentally felt, her, felt fear stab coldly up her throat, and she remembered the scream. They're alive, but only just. And when you said, don't leave me alone, what you heard, and it had to be through your fire lizards, was Breck calling out to Fenor and Kent. Sylvina broke her narrative for effect. Somehow they got back, well, partway back from the Red Star. It must have been the most incredible sight. Sylvina's tired eyes narrowed, reconstructing that vision. The reason the whole dragon took off was to help land Kent. It was like a path, Robinson tells us, of dragons in the air, catching Kant and Fenor and breaking their fall. They were both senseless, of course. Robinson says there isn't a scrap of hide left in Kant, as if some mighty hand had sanded their skin away. Fenor is not much better, for all he wore wear hide. Sylvina, how could my fire lizards know what was happening at Benden Weir? Rameth called the dragons. The Benden Queen can do that, you know. The fire lizards have been at Benden Weir. Perhaps they heard her too. Sylvina dismissed that part of the mysterious mystery impatiently. But Sylvina, my fire lizards were afraid long before Ramoth called the, drag the fort dragon, even before I heard Breck's call. Why, that's right. Oh, well, we'll find the answer to that mystery in due time. We always do at the Harper Hall. If dragons can talk to dragons across distance, why can't fire lizards? Dragons think sense, Memily said, gently scratching her waking queen's little head, and these beauties don't, at least not often. Babies don't make sense, and your fire lizards aren't all that long out of the shell. But think on it, Memily. Camo doesn't make sense, much sense, but he does have feelings. Was it he who fed my fire lizards this morning so I could sleep? He and Pimer, Camo fussed and fussed before breakfast until I had to send him up here with Pimer to shut his moans. Sylvina's chuckle was half amusement, half remembered irritation. Nag, nag, nag about pretty's hungry. Feed pretty's. 
Beimer said, you didn't wake, did you? No, but the matter of the fire lizard intelligence was more urgent in Menelie's estimation. I suppose being at Bend and Weir might explain the reaction. Not entirely, Sylvina replied briskly. Lord Groves' little friend responded too. It wasn't hatched at Benden and has never been there. There may be more or to these creatures than being silly pets after all and making idiots of men who fancy themselves as good as dragon riders. I've finished my claw. Shall we see to the eggs now? Yes, by all means. If his eggs should hatch without the harper, we'd never hear the end of it. Is Siebel about? Hovering. Sylvina's grimace was so maliciously expressive that Menelie laughed. How's your feet today? Only stiff. Just remember that that salve doesn't do you any good in the jar. Yes, Sylvina. Don't you yes, Sylvina, me, meekly, my girl. And there was unexpected warmth and affection in the woman's tone. Menelie smiled shyly, but back at the head woman as the head woman left the room. She dressed quickly in one of the new tunics and the blue wear hide trousers, plumped up the rushes in their bag and soothed or smoothed the sleeping fur over all. Sylvina had just finished tidying up the harper's room when Menelie entered, beauty winging in gracefully behind her. She landed on Menelie's shoulder and as Menelie checked both eggs, peered with equal curios, equally curious interest. She chirped a question at Menelie. Well, drawled Sylvina, now that your experts have conferred, Menelie giggled. I don't think Beauty knows any more than I do. She's never seen eggs hatch, but they are a good deal harder. They've been kept so nicely warm. I don't know for sure, but I suspect that they'll hatch any time now. Sylvina drew in her breath sharply, startling Beauty. That Harper, the problem will be keeping track of him. She gave the rush bag a final poke and twitched the sleeping fur straight. If Lord Grow and Sylvina... If Lord Grow and Sylvina jerked her head towards the porthole palisade, isn't sending for him, Philar is, or Lord Lytall for that white dragonette. If he wants to impress his fire lizard, he'll have to make a choice, won't he? Sylvina gasped as, at Melanie for a long moment and then burst out laughing. Might be the best thing that's happened since the queens were killed, Sylvina said, mopping laugh tears from her eyes. The man's had no more than a few hours sleep a day. Sylvina gestured towards the study room, flicking her fingers at the scattered piles of records, the scrawls on the sand table surface, the half-empty wine sack with its pouring neck collapsed ludicrously to one side. He won't miss the impression of his fire lizard, but isn't there some sign to tell if it, the hatching is imminent? The dragon men can tell, and what the harper's doing is really urgent. When Beauty and the others hatched, the old queen and her flight hummed, sort of a deep sort of deep in the throat, Menelie said cautiously after a moment's thought. Sylvina nodded encouragingly. This isn't Beauty's clutch, so I don't know if she'll react, though the drags at Bend and Weir hummed for Ramoth's clutch. So it seems logical that the fire lizards would react the same way. Sylvina agreed. There'd be a slight interval in which we could track the harper down. Supposing we can't get him to stay put here for the next day or two? Menelie hesitated, reluctant to agree to the conclusion achieved by guesswork. And they eat anything when they hatch? Asked Sylvina, who appeared content with the supposition. Just about, Menelie remembered the sack of spider claws, not the easiest of edibles, that had gone down the throats of her newly hatched friends. Red meat is best. That will please Camo, Sylvina said cryptically. Now, I think you'd best stay here. Well, what's wrong with that? Robin Hood would give up more than the privacy of his quarters to have a fire lizard. He's even threatened to forgo his wine. Sylvina had a snort for that unlikely sacrifice. Well, what is wrong with you? Sylvina, it's afternoon, isn't it? Yes, indeed. I'm pledged to go. I must go to Master Shonagar. He, he was very insistent. Oh, he was, was he? And will he explain to Master Robinton that your voice is more important than the Harper's fire lizard? Oh, don't get yourself in a pucker. Siebel can sit in for you and you tell your fire lizards to stand by. Sylvina walked to the open window and peered down into the courtyard. Pimer, Pimer, ask Siebel to step up to the harper's room, will you? Menely, yes, she's awakened here. Now, or no, she can't attend Master Shonagar until Siebel arrives, yes? Well, go through the choir hall to the journeyman's quarters and give Master Shonagar my message. Menely answers to Ro Master Robinton first, me second, and then any of the other masters who require her attention. I love her. Menely fretted about Master Shonagar's certain wrath while Sylvina made her wait until Pimer had found and returned 
at a run with Siebel. They're hatching, Siebel slithered to a stop in the doorway, breath breathing hard, his face flushed and anxious. Not quite yet, Menelie said, ready to speed to Mester Shanagar, but unwilling to brush impolitely past the, sh the journeyman blocking the entrance. How will I know? Menelie says the fire lizards hum, replied Sylvina. Shanagar insists on her presence now. He would. Where's the harper? At Ratha Hold by now, I think, Sylvina said. He went off to Bend and Weir when the dragon rider came for him. He said he'd stop off to see Master Smith Fandero at Telgar. Honey, can you um, turn off the oven? I'm curing some cast iron. <laughs> Siebel's eyes went from Sylvina to Menelie in surprise, as if Sylvina were being indis indiscreet. More than any other, saving yourself, Menelie, will need to know how many tunes a harper, much less the harper, plays, she said. I'll send more claw, and now she chuckled. Have Camo lay about with that hatchet of his on the meat. Menelie told the fire lizards to stay by Siebel, and then she scurried down the steps and across the courtyard to the chorus hall. Despite Sylvina's reassurance, Menelie was apprehensive as she made her tardy arrival before Master Shonagar, but he said nothing that made her dereliction harder. He kept looking at her until she nervously began to shift her weight from foot to foot. I do not know what it is about you, young Menelie, that you can disrupt an entire craft hall, for you are not presumptuous. In fact, you are immodestly modest. You do not brag, nor flaunt your rank, nor put yourself forward. You listen, which I assure you is a pleasure and relief, and you learn from what you are told, which is veritably unheard of. I begin to entertain hope that I have finally discovered a mere, in a mere slip of a girl the dedication required to a true musician, an artist. Yes, I might even coax a real voice out of your throat. His, first, his fist came down with an almighty wallop on the sand table, the opposite end flapping onto its supports. She jumped, but even if I cannot do much if you are not here, Sylvina said, Sylvina is a wonderful woman. Without her, the hall would be in chaos and our comfort ignored, Master Shonagar said, still in a loud tone. She is also a good musician. Ah, you didn't know that. You should make the occasion to listen to her singing, my dear girl. But, again, the voice boomed, Master Shonagar's belly bouncing, although the rest of him seemed stationary. I thought I had made it plain that you are to be here without fail every single day. Yes, sir, come fog fire or fall. Have I made myself plain enough? Yes, sir. Then, and his voice dropped to normal prop proportions, let us begin with breathing. Menelie fought the desire to giggle. She mastered it by breathing deeply and then settled quickly to the discipline of the lesson. When Master Shonagar had dismissed her with a further injunction to be on time, not the next day, which was a rest day, and he needed his rest, but the following day, the work parties were back from their chores. To her surprise, she was greeted by many of the boys as she raced past them to get back to the fire lizard eggs. She answered, smiling, unsure of names and faces, but inwardly warmed by their recognition. As she took the steps to the higher level two at a time, she wondered if the boys all knew about the previous night's disturbance. Probably, news spread faster in this craft hall than thread could burrow. The sounds of soft guitar strumming reached her ears as she got to the upper hall, she slowed down, out of breath anyhow, and arrived at the harper's quarters, still breathing heavily, much as Siebel had done. She glanced up, grinned understandingly, and held up a hand to reassure her. Then his hand gestured to the sand table. All her fire lizards were there, crouched, waiting for him, watching him. I've had an audience. What I can't tell is if my music has pleased them. It has, Menelie told him, smiling. She extended her arm for beauty, who immediately glided to her. See, their eyes tell you. The green is dominant, which is sleeping pleasure. Red means hunger. Blue and green are sort of general shades. White means danger. And yellow is fright. The speed of the eye whirls tells you how intensely they feel about something. What about him, then? And Siebel pointed to Lazy, whose eyes were first lidded. He's called Lazy Bones for good reason. I wasn't playing a lullaby, except when he's hungry, he's that way. Here, said, and Melanie scooped Lazy up from the sand table and deposited, deposited him on Siebel's arm. Startled, the man froze, stroke, stroke his eye ridges in the back joints of the wings. There, see, he's crooning with delight. Siebel had obeyed her instructions, and now Lazy collapsed about the journeyman's forearm, locked his claws loosely about the wrist, and stretched his head across the back of Siebel's hand. Siebel caressed him, a shy and delighted smile on his face. I hadn't thought they'd be so soft to the touch. 
You have to watch for patchy skin and oil it well. I did a thorough job on these the other evening, but you can see where I'll have to do them again. Just stay there, and Menelie quickly went down the hall to her room for the salve, beauty complaining at the jouncing on her shoulder. As they spread salve on the fire lizards, Siebel be grew more confident of his handling of the creatures. He wore a half smile as if surprised to find himself at such a task. Do all fire lizards sing, he asked, oiling Brownie. I don't really know. I suppose mine learned simply because I used to sing to them in the cave. Menely smiled to herself, remembering the fire lizards perched attentively on the ledges about the cave, their little heads turning from side to side to catch the sound of music. Any audience being better than none? Asked Siebel, did anyone think to tell you that Lord Groh's little queen has recently started to sing along with the old harper? Oh no, if Groh could carry a tune, Siebel went on, enjoying her dismay. It'd be understandable. Don't worry about it, Menely. I heard also that Groh's delighted. Then Siebel's expression altered subtly. I'll bet Lord Groh wasn't so happy about it last about last night, was he? She hesitated and blurted, blurted out, do you think Kanth and Fenor will live? They have much to live for, Menely. Breck needs them to stay alive. She's lost her queen already. She'll make them live. We'll know more when the harbor returns. Kimmo entered the room, carrying a heavily laden tray. His thick featured face changed from ludicrous anxiety to beams of joy as he saw first the fire lizards and then Menely. Pretty ones hungry, Kemo has food? And Menely saw two huge pans of meat in pieces among the other dishes on the tray. Thank you for feeding the pretties this morning, Kemo. Kemo, very quiet, very quiet. The man bobbed at Menely in such a fashion that the pitcher of cloth splashed. Siebel deftly relieved him of the tray and set it on the sand table center board. You're a good man, Kemo, the journey said, but go to the kitchen now. You must help Abuna, she needs you. Pretty ones hungry? The disappointment was writ large on Kemo's face. Not now, Kemo, Menely said gently, smiling up at him. See, they're asleep. Kemo turned himself in a circle towards the sand table, and then the window ledges were oh, and and then the window ledges were where several of the fire lizards were sprawled on the sun warmed stone, glistening from their recent oiling. We'll feed them again tonight, Kemo. Tonight? Good. Don't forget. Promise, promise. Kemo, feed pretties. I promise, Kemo, Menely said with extra fervor, the wistful, piteous way in which the poor man asked her to promise suggested that too many promises made to Kemo were conveniently forgotten. Now, Siebel said as the man shuffled from the room, Sylvina said you'd no time for more than claw when you woke. If I remember Shonagar's lessons, you'll be starved. To Menely's delight, there was red fruit on the tray as well as meat rolls, claw, cheese, bread, and a sweet conserve. Siebel ate lightly, more to keep her company than because he was hungry, though he said he'd been studying. To prove that, he rattled off the names and descriptions of the fish, of the fish she had given him the other morning. Did I remember them all correctly? He asked, peering at her as she startled, as she started at him in amusement. Yes, you did. Think I can pose as a seaman now? If you only have to name fish, if only, he paused dramatically, making a grimace for that restriction. I had a chat with a bronze dragon rider I know at Fort Weir. He's agreed to take us on the quiet to any bottle of water that you feel is adequate to teach me how to sail. Teach you how to sail? Mentally was appalled. In one easy lesson like those fish names? No, but I don't think I'll actually have to sail. I should know the fundamentals and leave, he grinned at her, the doing of the experts in the craft. Oh, the doing to the experts in the craft. She breathed a sigh of relief, for she liked Siebel, and she'd been distressed to think that he might be foolhardy enough to attempt sailing on the ocean by himself. Giannis had often said that no one ever really learned all there was to know about the sea, the winds and the tides. Just when she got, one was confident a squall could make up and smash a ship to splinters. I do feel that to be convincing, I'd better know how to gut fish as well. That seems a more integral part of the craft than actual sailing. So that will take priority in your instruction. Natan said he could acquire some fresh fish for me with no problem. Again, Menelie suppressed her curiosity as to why a journeyman harper needed to be convenient or conversant with a sea craft. Tomorrow's a rest day, Siebel continued. There may even be a gather if the weather holds, which to my landsman's eye seems likely. So if the fire lizards break shell, and if we can disappear circumspectly, perhaps someday after that, I can't miss my lessons with Master Shanagar. Has he got you dithering so soon? 
he is so emphatic. Yes, he usually is, but he really knows how to build a voice if that's any consolation to you. I could always play an instrument and Siebel grinned in rem reminiscence, but I never thought I'd make a singer. I was terrified I'd be sent away from the hall. You were? Oh, indeed I was. We'd wanted to, I'd wanted to be a harper since I learned my first ballads. I'm landsman bred, so harpering is very respectable. My foster father gave me all the assistance I needed and our old harper was a good technician, not very creative and Siebel waggled a hand, but capable of teaching the fundamentals thoroughly. I thought myself a right proper musician until I got here. Siebel uttered a self-deprecating noise at his boyish pretensions. Then I learned just how much more there is to harpering than playing an instrument. Mentally grinned with complete understanding, just like there's more to being a seaman than knowing how to gut a fish and trim sail. Yes, exactly. Which reminds me, Dominic did excuse you from this morning's session, but he hasn't excused you from the work. So we might as well put waiting time to use. Incidentally, my compliments to your manner with Dominic yesterday. You struck exactly the right note with him. I never play flat. Siebel gave a wide-eyed stare. I didn't mean playing. He stared at her a moment more. You mean you really like that sort of music? You weren't disassemb uh, dissembling? That music was brilliant. I've never heard anything like it. Mentally was a bit disconcerted by Siebel's attitude. Oh, I guess it would seem to you, so to you. I only hope you have the same opinion several turns from now after you've had to endure more of Domic's eternal search for pure musical forms. He gave a mock shudder here and he spread out sheets of new music. Let's see how you like this. Dominic wants you to play first guitar, but you're to learn the second as well. Thanks for turning the oven off. <clears throat> the occasional music of uh, for two guitars was extremely complex, switching from one time value to another with cording difficult enough for uninjured hands. She and Siebel had to work out alternative fingerings for the passages that her left hand could not manage. The repetitive theme had to dominate, but it swung from one guitar part to the other. They had gone through two of the three sections before Siebel called a break, laughing at his surrender as he stretched and kneaded tired fingers and shoulders. We won't get this music note perfect in one sitting, mentally, he protested when she wanted to finish the third movement. I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Will you stop apologizing for the wrong things? I'm so, well, I didn't mean to. She had to rephrase what she wanted to say as Siebel laughed at her attempt to obey his injunction. This sort of music is a challenge, it really is. For instance, here. And she turned to a quick time passage that had been extremely difficult to finger. Enough mentally, I'm bone tired. And why aren't, and why you aren't? But you're a journeyman harper. I know, but this journeyman harper cannot spend all his time playing. What do you do besides crosscraft? Whatever the harper needs me to do, primarily I journey, looking among the youngsters in hold and craft to see if there's any likely ones for the craft hall. I bring new music to distant harpers, your music most recently, my music. First, to flush you out because we didn't know you were a girl. Second, because they were exactly the songs we needed. That's what Master Robinson said. Don't sound so surprised and meek. Admittedly, it's nice to have one modest apprentice in this company of rampant extroverts. What's the matter? Why is it music like Master Domic's? Your music can be played easily and well by any half-stringed harper or crumble-fingered idiot. Not that I'm maligning your songs. It's just that they're an entirely different kettle of fish. To use a seemingly metaphor, to Domic's, don't you judge your songs against his standard. More people have already listened to your melodies and liked them than will ever hear Domic's, much less like them. Mentally swallowed, the very notion that her music was more acceptable than Domic's was incredible. And yet she could appreciate the distinction that Siebel was making. Domic was a musician's composer. Of course, we need music like Master Domic's too. It serves a different purpose for the hall and the craft. He knows more about the art of composing, which you have to learn. Oh, I know I do. Then because the problem had been weighing heavily on her conscience, she spilled the words out in a rush. What do I do, Siebel, about the Fire Lizard song? Master Robinson wrote it, and it's much, much better, but rewrote it. But he's told everyone that I wrote it. So? That's the way the Harper wishes it to be, mentally. He has his reasons. Siebel reached out to grip her knee and give her a little shake. And he didn't change that, the song much, just sort of 
Siebel gestured with both hands, compressing the space between them, tightened it up. He kept the melody as you'd written it, and that's what everyone is humming. What you have to do now is learn how to polish your music without losing its freshness. That's why it's so important for you to study with Dominic. He has the discipline. You have the originality. Menley could not reply to that assessment. There was a lump in her throat as she remembered the beating she'd taken for doing exactly what she was now encouraged to do. Don't hunch up like that, Siebel said almost sharply. What's the matter? You've gone white as a sheet. Shells. This last word came out as an expletive and caused Menely to look in surprise at the journeyman, just when I didn't want to be interrupted. She followed the line of his gaze and saw the bronze dragon circling down to land between beyond the courtyard. That's Natan. I've got to speak to him, Menely, about our teaching trip. I'll be right back. He was out of the room at a trot, and she could hear him taking the steps in a clatter. She looked at the music they'd been playing, and Siebel's words echoed through her mind. He has the discipline. You have the originality. Everyone's been humming it. Sorry, something just chirped on the computer. People liked liking her twiddles? That still didn't seem possible, although Siebel had no more reason to lie to her than the Master Harper when he'd said that her music was valuable to him. To the Harper craft, incredible. She struck a chord on the guitar, a triumphant, incredible chord, and then modulated it, thinking how undisciplined that musical reaction had been. They were still twiddles, her songs, unlike the beautiful, intricate musical designs that Domic composed, but if she studied hard with him, maybe she could improve her twiddles into what she could honestly call music. Firmly, she turned to her thoughts toward the guitar duet and ran through the tricky passages, slowly at first and then finally at time. One of the chords modulated into tones that were so close to the agonized cry of the previous night that she repeated the phrase, don't leave me alone and then found another chord that fit. The cry in the night of anguish, heart-stricken, striking, of soul-killing fright. That's what Siebel had said, that Breck would not want to live if Kent and Fenora died. Live for, me, live for my living or else I must die. Don't leave me alone, a world heard that cry. By the time Menely had arranged the chords in the plaint to her satisfaction, Beauty, Rocky, and Diver were softly crooning along with her. So she worked on the verse. Well, you approve, she asked her fair. Perhaps I ought to jot it, jot it down or sound something. No need, said a quiet voice behind her, and she whirled on the stool to see Siebel seated at the sand table, scribbling quickly. I think I've got most of it. He looked up, saw the startled expression on her face, and gave her a brief smile. Close your mouth and come check my notation. But, but, what did I tell you, Menley, about apologizing for the wrong things? I was just tuning. Oh, the song's... The song needs polishing, but that refrain is poignant enough that set a hole to tears. He beckoned again to her, a crisp gesture that brought her to his side. He might want to change the sequence, give the peril first, the solution next, though I don't know, with that melody. Do you always use minors? He slid a glass across the sand so the scribbling couldn't be erased. We'll see what the harper thinks. Now what's wrong? Leave it? You can't be serious. I can be, and usually am, young Menely he said, rising from the stool to reach for his guitar. Now, let's see if I put it down correctly. Emily sat, immersed in ac acute embarrassment, to hear Siebel playing a tune of her making. But she had to listen. When her fire lizards began to croon softly along with Siebel's deft playing, she was about ready to concede, privately, that it wasn't a bad tune after all. That's very well done, Siebel. Didn't know you had it in you, said the Master Harper, applauding vigorously from the doorway. I'd rather dreaded transferring that incident to music. This song, Master Robinson, is Menely's. Siebel had risen at the Harper's entrance, and now he bowed deferentially to Menely. Come, girl, it's why the Harper's search a continent for you. Menely, my dear child, no blushes for that song. Robinson seized her hands and clasped them warmly. Think of the chore. You just saved me. In a, I came in halfway through the verse, Siebel, if you would please. And the Harper gestured to Siebel to begin again. With one long arm, Robinson snaked a stool out from under the flat bottom sand table and still holding Menely by the hand, he composed himself to listen to Siebel's clever fingerings, plucked the haunting phrases from the augmented chords. Now, Menely, think only of the music as Siebel plays, not that it is your music. Let, learn to think objectively, not subjectively. Listen as a harper. He held her hand so tightly in his that she could not pull away without giving offense. The clasp of his fingers was more than reassuring. It was therapeutic. 
Her embarrassment ebbed as the music and Siebel's warm baritone voice flowed into the room. When the fire lizards hummed loud, Robinson squeezed her hand and smiled down at her. Yes, a little work on the phrases. One or two words could be altered, I think, to heighten the effect, but the whole can stand. Can you scribe? Ah, Siebel, well done, well done, said the harper as Siebel tapped the protective, protecting glass. I want it transferred to some of those neat paper sheets Ben Dirac supplies with us, so Mentally can go over it at her leisure. Not too much leisure, and the harper held up a warning hand because that fire lizard echo swept around Pern, and we must explain it. A good song, Mentally, a very good song. Don't doubt yourself so fiercely. Your, indis your instinct for melodic line is very good, very good indeed. Perhaps I should send more of my apprentices to a sea hold for a time if this is the sort of talent the waves provoke. And see, your affair is still humming the line. Mentally drew out her confusion long enough to realize that the fire lizard's hum had nothing to do with her song. Their attention was not on the human eggs. The eggs, they're hatching, they're hatching, hatching! Both masters and journeymen crowded each other to get through the door to the hearth and the fire warming pots. Mentally, come here. I'm getting the meat. They're hatching, the harper shouted. They're hatching. Grab that pot, Man Siebel. It's wobbling. As Mentally dashed into the room, the two men were kneeling at the hearth, watching anxiously at, as the earthen pots rocked slightly. They can't hatch in the pots, she said with a certain amount of asperity in her voice. She took the pot from the protecting encirclement of Siebel's curved fingers and carefully upended it on the hearth. Her fingers cushioned the egg until the sand piled away from it. She turned to Robinton, but he had already followed her example. Both eggs lay in the light of the fire, rocking slightly, the striations of hatching marking, hatching marking the shells. The fire lizards lined up on the mantle and the hearth, humming deep in their throats. The pulsing sound seemed to punctuate the now violent movements of the eggs, and the hatchlings fluttered against the shells for, for exit. Master Robinton, called Savina from the outer room. Master Robinton? Savina, they're hatching! The harper's jubilant bellow startled mentally as she set the fire lizards to squawking and flapping their wings in surprise. Other harper, harpers, curious about the noise, began to crowd in behind Savina, who stood at the door to the harper's sleeping quarters. If there were too many people in the room, mentally thought, no, stay out, keep them out, she cried before she realized she'd said anything. Yes, stay back now, Savina was saying. You can't all see. You've got the meat mentally. Ah, oh, so you have. Is it enough? It should be. What do we do now? Asked the harper, his voice rough with supp suppressed excitement as he crouched above the egg. When the fire lizard emerges, feed it, Mentally said, somewhat surprised, for the harper must have been a guest at numerous dragon hatchings. Just stuff its mouth with food. When will they hatch? Asked Siebel, washing his fingers in his palms with excited frustration. The fire lizard's hum was getting more intense their eyes whirling with participation in the event. Suddenly, a second little golden queen erupted into the room, her eyes spinning. She let out a squeal, which Beauty answered, lifting her wings higher, but in greeting, not challenge. Sylvina mentally pointed to the queen. Master Robinson, look, said the head woman, and as they all watched, the newly arrived queen took her place on the mantel beside Beauty, her throat vibrating as fast as the others. That's Murga, Lord Groves' queen, said the harper, and then, he glanced over his shoulder at the door. I hope it isn't an awkward time for him. This sort of summons could be inconvenient. Above the fire lizard's vibrant sounds, they all heard the harper's name bellowed. Someone go and escort Lord Grow, ordered the harper, his eyes never leaving the hearth and the two eggs. Robinton, it would seem that this order was unnecessary for the bellower was rapidly approaching. Rob, what, they are? Do you know what? That murga of mine's in another taking forced me to come here, here now. What's all this? Where is Robinton? Mentally tore her eyes from the two eggs. Though she was certain this, she saw a widening crack in one of the, in the one on the left to see the entrance of the Lord Fort Holder. As his voice indicated, he was a big man, almost as tall as the harper, but much broader in the torso. With thick thighs and bulging calves, he walked lightly for all his mass, although he was breathing heavily from having come to the hall at a fair pace. There you are. What's this all about? The eggs are about to hatch, Lord Grow. Eggs? The brows of the holder's florid face were contracted, contracted into a puzzled scowl. Oh, your eggs. They're hatching. And Murga's reacting. I trust not to any inconvenience to you, Lord Grow. Well, no, not so. 
I wouldn't come when she insisted. How'd the creature know? Ask Mentally. Mentally? And suddenly, Mentally found herself the object of intense frowning scrutiny. You're Mentally? The brows went up in surprise. Little bit of a thing, aren't you? Not at all what I expected. Don't blush. I don't bite. The, my fire lizard might. Wouldn't worry you, though, would it? These are all yours? Why, my queen's beside yours. Friendly as can be. They're not dangerous at all. Mentally, the harper's explanation brought her attention back to the hearth. His egg had given a convulsive rock, all but spinning itself off the hearthstone. Gasping, he put out both hands to prevent its falling. The shell cracked wide open, and a little bronze fire lizard rolled into his hands, creeling with hunger, its body glistening. Feed it, feed it, mentally cried. Robinson, unable to take his eyes off the fire lizard, fumbled for the piled meat and shoved food into the fire lizard's open mouth. The little bronze, shaking his, its wings out for balance, snatched ferociously at the meat, gobbling so fast that Mentally held her breath for fear the creature would choke in its greed. Not too much. Make it wait. Talk to it. Soothe it, Mentally urged. Just then, the other egg split. It's a queen, shouted Siebel, rocking back on his heels in the excess of his surprise. Only Lord Groh's quick hand on his back kept him from falling over. Feed her, the Lord Holder barked. But I'm not to have the queen. For one split second, Siebel started to turn and offer the queen to the harper. It's too late, Mentally shouted, diving forward to intercept the gesture. She jammed the meat on Siebel's seeking hand and then pushed it back to the frantically creeling queen. You're supposed to have a fire lizard. It doesn't matter which. The harper was oblivious to the interchange. He was intent on his bronze, stroking it, feeding it, crooning to it. The little queen had gobbled Siebel's initial offering, but her tail wrapping so firmly about his wrist that he could not have disengaged himself had he managed to sustain his moment of sacrifice. Mentally turned to assist the harper, but Lord Grow was kneeling beside him, encouraging him. When the two hatchlings were bulging with food, Mentally removed the meat bowls. They'll burst with another mouthful, she told the reproachful harpers. Now, hold them against you, stroke them. They should fall asleep. There now. As the men complied with her urgings, the new fire lizard sated for the present, wearily closed their eyes, their little heads drooping to the protective forearms. She'd forgotten what a scant handful a newly hatched fire lizard was. Her friends had grown so much since hatching. Lord Groh's Murga was as tall as the shoulder, as, as tall in the shoulder as beauty, but not so deeply chested. The two were now exchanging compliments, stroking heads and touching curved wings. It's incredible, the harper said, his voice, his words, no more than an articulated whisper, his eyes brilliant with joy. It is absolutely the most incredible experience I have ever had. Know what you mean, Lord Groh replied in an embarrassed mumble, ducking his head. But Mentally could see that the burly holder's face was flushed. Can't forget it myself. Carefully, Harper Robinson rose from his knees, his eyes on the sleeping fire lizard, his free hand poised in case an incautious movement unsettled the little bronze. It explains so very much that I could never have understood about dragon riders. Yes, it opens a whole new area of understanding. He sat way back. He sat down on the ledge of his bed. Now I can sense dimly what Lytol, what Breck must have suffered, and now why young Jackson must have Ruth. He smiled at Lord Groves' grunt at that statement. Yes, I have stood so long peering through a small opening into another hold of understanding. Now I can see without obstruction. His eyes had dropped to his chest as he spoke in soft, reflective tones, more to himself than those close enough to catch the whispered words. He shook himself slightly and looked up, his smile again radiant. What a gift you have made me, Mentally. What a significant, magnificent gift. Beauty came to perch on Mentally's shoulder, her humming now diminished in a soft murmur of sound. Lord Groh's queen, Murga, flew to his shoulder, wrapping her tail about his thick neck, just as Beauty did. I don't know how it happened, Master Robinson, Siebel said, rising from the hearth with exaggerated care. His manner was both defensive and apologetic. The pots were in the wrong order. I don't understand. You should have had the queen. My dear Siebel, I couldn't care in the slightest. This bronze fellow is everything I could ever want, and frankly, I believe that it might be more advantageous for you to have the queen, going out and about the land as you'll have to do. Yes, I think chances have worked. Chances worked more for than against us and i am quite content oh indeed i am with my bronze man here what a lovely lovely creature he had eased himself back against the bolster the fire lizard snuggled in the crook of his arm his other hand protectingly cradling the open side 
such a lovely big fellow. His eye, his head fell back, his eyes heavy, all but asleep himself. Now that's a real miracle, said Sylvina in a very soft voice, asleep without wine or fellas juice. Out, out. She shook her hands at those crowding the door, but her gesture to Lord Roe to precede her from the room was a touch more courteous. The Lord Holder nodded agreement and made a great show of tiptoeing quietly across the room. His exit cleared the doorway of onlookers. Sylvina picked up the half-filled bowls by the fire and put one near the harper's hand. Mentally beckoned to the rest of her fare and they flitted about the window. Got them well trained, haven't you? Lord Gro said once Sylvina had closed the door to the harper's chambers. Want to have a long chat with you about them? Robitin says they'll fetch and carry for you. Do you believe as he does that what one fire lizard knows, the others do too? Too disconcerted to reply, Menelik glanced frantically at Sylvina and saw her nod encouragingly. It would seem logical, Lord Gro. Um, it would certainly account for, for what happened the other night. In fact, there's no other way to account for that, is there? Unless you can speak to dragons. I'm out of water. <clears throat> Unless you can speak to dragons, Lord Gro laughed ponderously poking Menelik's shoulder with her finger in good humor. Speak to dragons! Ah! Menelik felt herself grinning because his laughter was a bit contagious and she didn't know what else to do. She hadn't meant to be funny. Then Sylvina shushed them in imperiously, pointing urgently at the harper's closed door. Sorry, Sylvina, Lord Gro said contritely. Most amazing thing. Woke up out of a sound sleep, scared out of my wits. Never happened to me before, I can tell you. He nodded his head emphatically and Merga chip chirped. Wasn't your fault, pet, he said, stroking her tiny head with a thick forefinger, only doing the same as the others. What? That's what I want you to teach me, girl. The forefinger now pointed at Menelie. You will, won't you? Robinson says you have your strange a treat. It would be my privilege, sir. Well spoken. Lord Gro turned his heavy torso in Sylvina's direction, favoring the head woman with a fierce stare. Well spoken, child. Not what I expected. Can't trust other people's opinions. Never did, never will. I'll arrange something with Robinson later. Not too much later, but later. Good day to you all. With that, the Lord Holder of Fort, St of Fort strode from the room, nodding and smiling to the Harpers still gathered in the corridor. Menly saw Siebel and Sylvina exchanging worried glances, and she moved across the room to stand before them. What did Lord Gro mean, Sylvina? I'm not what he expected. I was afraid you'd catch that, Sylvina said, her eyes narrowed with a contained anger. She patted Menly's shoulder absently. There's been loose talk, which has done them no good and you no harm. I've a few knees to set knocking, so I have. Menelie was thoroughly and unexpectedly consumed with anger. Beauty chittered, her eyes beginning to whirl re redly. Those cot girls stay up at hold during Threadfall, don't they? <clears throat> Sylvina gave Menelie a long, quelling look. I say I'll handle the matter, Menelie. You, and S Sylvina pointed at her, will occupy yourself with harbor business. She was clearly as furious as Menelie flicked imaginary dust from her skirt with unnecessary force. You're to stay here, both of you, and be sure nothing disturbs the harper. Nothing, you understand? She pinned, or she pined apprentice. She pinned apprentice and journeyman with a stern glare. He's asleep, and he's to stay asleep as long as that little creature lets him. That way he might get caught up on himself for a change before he's worn to death. She picked up the tray. I'll send your suppers up with Camo and their suppers as well. She closed the door firmly behind her. Menelie looked at the closed door for a long moment, still feeling the anger in her guts. She'd not really done the girls any kind of harm, so why would they try prejudice, try to prejudice the Lord Holder against her? Or perhaps it was all Duca's convince, connivance. Menelie knew that the little cot holder hated her for the humiliation caused by the fire lizards. Now that Menelie was at this, the hall, why should Dunka persist? She glanced back to Siebel, who was regarding her even as he cradled his sleeping little queen. Leave it, Menelie, he said in a quiet but emphatic tone. He gestured her to the sand table. Harper business is better business for you. Master Robinson said you were to copy the song onto sheets. Moving carefully so as not to disturb his little queen, he got supplies from the shelves and put them on the center board. So copy. I don't understand what they thought they'd accomplish prejudicing Lord Gro against me. What would he do? Siebel said nothing as he hooked a stool under his arm and sat down. He pointed at the music. It's only right for me to know. The insult is mine to settle. Sit down, Menelie, and copy. 
that's far more important to the harper and the hall than any petty machinations of envious girls. They could do me a mischief, couldn't they? If they'd got Lord Grow to believe what, what they said, I never hurt those girls. True enough, but that's not, that is not Harper business. The song is, copy it. And one more word from you on an, any other subject and I'll, if you're not quiet, you'll wake up, you'll wake your fire lizard, mentally said. But she sat down at the table, started co copying. She could recognize obstinacy when she saw it and it would do her no good to set Siebel against her. What are you going to name her? She asked, name her? Sable was started and startled and mentally was dismayed to realize how much of his joy in his queen had been diminished by her silly concern over gossip. Why, I can have the privilege of naming her, can't I? She's mine, I think. And his eyes glowed with affection for the hatchling. I think I'll call her Kimmy. That's a lovely name, replied mentally and then bent to her copying with a good heart. That is the end of chapter seven. It was very, very long. It is an hour and 15 minutes into this live stream and I've been reading for almost the whole hour. Shh, bedtimes. So let's see. All right, did everybody enjoy that book? The, well, the book's not over, that chapter. Oh, it said leave page. I don't wanna leave the page. I'm not gonna end the video yet. So did everybody enjoy it? And I just think that it's so cool that um, he named his queen Kimmy. I just love the name Kimberly, Kimmy. So I am really excited because Kimmy has been at Gurney Bear and Papa's house for about a week. And tomorrow they're coming here. And I'm really excited because I get to see everybody. And Kimmy gets to see some birthday surprises that we did for her. So that'll be kind of fun too. And here comes Heavy D himself to say good night. Easton, move. Okay. Hi. So I hope that everybody is enjoying the story. What was her name? The Fire Lizard, the Queen. Yeah, it was. It was a little quiet. It was it was hard oh, to hear when you said that, but I've also got the vacuum cleaner under me. Was I named after a fire lizard? <laughs> okay, that's a good question, which shall be answered at a later time. So. I hope that everybody's enjoying the story. We'll um, pick up with Mark chapter two and um, whatever it is, um, um, Dragon Singer, yeah, that's right, Dragon Singer chapter seven tomorrow. And um, I'm gonna just bid you all adieu and we're, and, and a good travels for those of you who are traveling. And God bless you, we'll see you tomorrow and have a good night.